Moving on to chapter 3 of the picture of Dorian Gray and I'm going to try my best to get through the few points that I want to get through as quickly as possible. Um, it starts off with Lord Henry visiting his uncle, Lord Fermor, because he's desperate to find out more details about Basil's friend, Dorian Gray. Um, he arrives, Lord Henry arrives at his uncle's place and they have a little conversation about how youth think that money is everything and when they get older they realize it is and blah blah blah. Anyway, Lord Henry says, I don't want money. It is only people who pay their bills who want that, and I never pay mine. So just the little things that he says throughout the novel um, create this greater idea and understanding of the type of person that Lord Henry is. And it doesn't always matter that, you know, he's not talking to Dorian Gray. It's not about... Um, you know, only when he speaks to Dorian Gray, it's about this is the type of person he is and this is how he talks to everybody. And to say something like, oh, I never pay my bills, um, you think to yourself, well, that's probably not true, uh, which creates the idea or strengthens the argument that he says things that he doesn't mean, that Lord Henry cannot actually be taken seriously. And Basil said that re right at the start of the novel. He said, I think that you're actually an excellent husband, probably, and that you, you say a lot of what things that you actually don't do, um, and that we, we can't take you seriously because I bet you haven't done you know, you, anything wrong. You say all these terrible things, but I bet you don't actually do them. Um, so the fact that he never pays his bills is probably a lie. He probably does. What I want is information, he says to his uncle. Not useful information, of course, useless information. I mean, why would somebody want useless information? And I guess it is kind of useless information, but he's just interested in Dorian Gray and he wants to find out more. The uncle says, well, I can tell you anything that is in an English blue book. You think of an English blue book in those days as almost a, a record book of names and addresses and things like that. Maybe family, lineage and, and whatever. Um, Lord Henry says, well, uh, here's the last Lord Kelso's grandson. So we know that Dorian Gray's grandfather was Lord Kelso, not a very nice man. Um, Dorian's mother was a Devereux, Lady Margaret Devereux, who I've highlighted in pink there just as a name. Not really important, but um, just so if you see that name, you know that's Dorian's mother. Uh, the uncle explains that she was an extraordinarily beautiful girl, which makes sense why Dorian is so good looking. And made all the men frantic by running away with a penniless young fellow, a soldier actually in the army. And of course she was of upper class, uh, Lord Kelso's daughter. And so it would be, have been a bad image and unexpected and, well for Lord Kelso, embarrassing for her to go and fall in love with some poor person, some poor guy with a low rank in the army. Um, the poor chap was killed in a duel at Spa a few months after the marriage. So what happened was, you can read all about this on page 42, but um, Lord Kelso arranged for somebody to have a duel with this man, uh, Dorian's father, and have him killed because he didn't want his daughter going around with this poor fellow. And we also discover that Dorian's mother died shortly after giving birth to Dorian, um, within a year of that whole duel. Um, then the uncle says, I hope he, will, he, Dorian, will fall into proper hands. And, well, unfortunately he does not fall into proper hands at all, does he? He falls into Lord Henry's hands, and uh, Lord Henry is an incredibly negative, toxic influence. Um, on the right-hand side, I've put that uh, this information makes Dorian a more tragic figure, which it definitely does. Um, you take Dorian, who we're going to see his downfall, um, but you see also that he had a, a rough upbringing, you know, that he didn't know his father at all or his mother, um, and he was left to be looked after this horrible man, Lord Kelso, who actually arranged for the father to be killed. Uh, so we have a sense of sympathy for Dorian. So when he has his downfall, we, you know, it's tragic because he had a tragic childhood. And yeah, he may be wealthy and all that, but um, it's not nice at all. So, moving on to page 44, behind every exquisite thing that existed, there was something tragic. And if we think about that, um, is there any truth to that? Well, I don't know about every, but 
you know, for us, if you think about a lot of uh, well-known people, famous people, celebrities, inventors, etc., uh, they often have quite a tragic backstory, or they grew up very poor, or there was abuse in the house, etc. So, I guess um, that could make sense. Um, but if we, you know, read further on into the novel and we come back to this and we can think, well, uh, behind every exquisite thing, that being Dorian Gray, is something tragic. Well, the portrait becomes incredibly tragic um, behind Dorian. So although Dorian may on the exterior outwardly not age and look perfect, there is in fact something tragic and terrible uh, behind the scenes, literally. Page 45, Dorian was a marvelous type, the type of person, you know, the fact that he had this strange, unusual childhood and um, he had purity of boyhood, innocent, naive, um, and then incredibly good looking, you know, uh, there was nothing that one could not do with him, um, like mold him like a piece of clay, which, you know, you shouldn't do. What a pity it was that such beauty was destined to fade. Well, of course, we as a well, we're going to discover that uh, that's not really going to happen, at least not for some time. Um, but yes, in, in fact, uh, what a pity that he is going to get older, according to everybody else. And Basil, well, from a psychological point of view, how interesting he was. From a psychological point of view, remember at the start of the novel, um, it goes to say that uh, well, Basil actually says that he's, he's grown to love secrecy and he doesn't reveal people, his friends' names and that because it uh, removes the secrecy kind of thing ar around them. And we also hear stories of Basil disappearing for weeks on end and, 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 and the fact that uh, he has this incredible idolization of Dorian Gray and the, the painting and he won't exhibit it and, you know, he won't bear his soul and all that. So... He is interesting in that sense because psychologically trying to understand what's going on in Basil's brain is, is like very, very fascinating. Page 46, Lord Henry would seek to dominate Dorian, had already indeed half done so. Yes, we can see that. And, um, you know, <laughs> um, Lord Henry is not subtle about his desire to dominate Dorian at all. And he's well aware of the fact that he is doing it. Um, he would make that wonderful spirit his own. So Lord Henry sees Dorian as an experiment and that he can do what he likes and say what he likes to Dorian and Dorian will react. And it's immaterial how Dorian reacts and what the outcome is. To Lord Henry, he doesn't care. You know, who cares if, if Dorian has a tragic downfall? or takes the advice and it ends badly for him. Uh, it's just an experiment. And we'll see that when Lord Henry talks to Dorian about Sybil Vane's death, as well as also being, you know, a marvelous experience, um, that is Lord Henry's view of, of life and of everything and of people. There's no regard for people. And as we'll see later, Sybil Vane is, is just... A, art form, you know, that there's no recognition that th this is real life and that's a real person who's committed suicide. Um, also, I've put there in chapter 2, Lord Henry said that all influence is immoral. It's bad. So he's hypocritical because now he's stating that, well, all he is going to make Dorian an experiment and, and influence him negatively. Um, and so he's recognizing that his own influence is not good, but he doesn't care. Lord Henry arrives at Aunt Agatha's sorry, Aunt Aunt, A Aunt Agatha's luncheon, um, where Dorian is already present, and of course Lord Henry arrives late. Surprise, surprise! Um, Dorian bowed to him shyly from the end of the table, a flush of pleasure stealing into his cheek. When Dorian Gray sees Lord Henry arrive, he is so happy; he is filled with pleasure because he is almost infatuated uh, with Lord Henry's um, theories. Page 49, Lady Agatha at this luncheon says to Dorian, Don't mind him, Lord Henry. Don't mind him, my dear. He never means anything that he says. And she is quite true. Um, and it's another warning, just like Basil warned Dorian, 
not to take what Lord Henry says seriously. He doesn't actually live those theories himself. Lord Henry goes on to say, I can sympathize with everything except suffering. And you think to yourself, well, that doesn't make sense. That's not very nice. That's wrong. We should sympathize with people who suffer. But Lord Henry says, nope, it is too ugly, too horrible, too distressing. Now, of course, when somebody is suffering, um, you, you try and sympathize with them. It's not a pleasant topic. It's not a nice thing to do. Um, and what Lord Henry is saying is, in fact, it's very ugly. And it's ugly, horrible, distressing. And the whole thing of hedonism is to experience pleasure at all costs. And so anything that distracts from pleasure should not be thought of, should be avoided. There is something terribly morbid in the modern sympathy with pain. When you and I would say, I think it's great that people are sympathetic with those who are suffering and, and in pain, whether emotional pain or physical pain. Lord Henry says one should sympathize with the color, the beauty, the joy of life. We get the asceticism and the, this new hedonism that Lord Henry says that society needs. The less said about life sores, the better. Well, I suppose if we read later, uh, we can see Dorian saying less about his life's sores, um, the better, because the portrait is hidden away and... Uh, it would reveal all his conscience and his terrible doings. So he certainly uh, doesn't want to mention anything about what he does. But that's uh, a little bit later. Page 49, the Duchess, who's at this luncheon, um, and they have this whole conversation at the table and all that, and, and Lord Henry is saying all these uh, little epigrams and sayings, and he's being very witty and being quite harsh and that. And the Duchess says to Lord Henry, you are really very comforting. You are really very comforting. So it's almost like Lord Henry is so witty, the guests are just charmed by him, despite his clear selfishness and, and wrong ways of thinking. And that's the whole point of Lord Henry's character. That is how he has got Dorian to be under his spell, as it were. Page 50, Lord Henry says, to get back one's youth, one has to merely repeat one's follies because the Duchess asks, I wish I could be young again. The only thing one never regrets are one's mistakes. And we think, no, that's not true. That's not, that's not good advice. Um, you know, you shouldn't, uh, if you do bad things or silly things when you're young, yeah, it's understandable you're young, you didn't know any different. But in order to be young again, you must go and remake those mistakes. That's not good advice. We were supposed to learn from our mistakes. Page 51, Dorian Gray never took his gaze off Lord Henry, but sat like one under a spell. There it is. That shows us how obsessed Dorian almost is with Lord Henry, how engrossed he is by what Lord Henry has to say. And we know as the reader that that's unfortunate because we have the ability to see that what Lord Henry says is not always good advice at all. Um, page 51, the Duchess leaves and says, Goodbye, Lord Henry, you are quite delightful and dreadfully demoralizing. And that sums up Lord Henry very well. What he has to say is delightful because you're just intrigued by what he's saying. And sometimes uh, he says these sort of half-truths, um, but they are dreadfully demoralizing in that he just tears life to pieces and he's so cynical and critical and just it's just poisonous and immoral very often what he has to say page 52 after that one of the guests at the table there uh, mr erskine asks lord henry may i ask if you really meant all that you said to us at lunch you can go and read up exactly what lord henry said in that but it, it wasn't very nice stuff and lord henry says i quite forget what i said was it all very bad which just proves that Lord Henry doesn't take what he says seriously because he can't even remember what he said. He, he just speaks. He just talks rubbish. He likes being the center of attention. He likes having the sound of his own voice going, you know. Um, Mr. Erskine says, yes, it was very bad indeed. In fact, I consider you extremely dangerous. And if anything happens to our good Duchess, we shall all look at you as being primarily responsible. Well, nothing really happens to the Duchess, but the fact of the matter is, is that that proves from somebody else's point of view, Mr. Erskine's, Erskine's point of view, 
that Lord Henry is or has the potential to be incredibly uh, influential to people around him, not in a good way. That same page um, it says, as Lord Henry was passing out of the door, Dorian Gray touched him on the arm and said, let me come with you. Lord Henry says, but I thought you had promised Basil to go and see him. And Dorian says, I would sooner come with you. So uh, there's no loyalty there. Poor Basil, who he's known far longer than he's known Lord Henry. Um, he rejects Basil. He lets him down. He declines, you know, the invitation. He There's no loyalty. I, I'm not going to, you know, I said I would go, but I'm not going to go. All I want to do is go with you, Lord Henry. It's almost as if, as I said, he's... Dorian is obsessed with Lord Henry. Uh, Dorian has fallen fully under the spell of Lord Henry's influence. Um, and of course, if we read further on, we know that it will end up very badly for Dorian and that Lord Henry's, uh, <laughs> what he says is in fact very bad indeed because Dorian adopts those ways of thinking and it ends badly for him. Um, Dorian says, I would sooner come with you and you, will, and you will promise to talk to me all the time. Promise that you're just going to talk to me all the time. All I want now is to, to look at life. You know, you may come and look at it with me if you care to. And so at this point, we can argue that Lord Henry is heartless and he's willing to develop Dorian with no thought of any consequence. Dorian's beauty is all that matters to him and and you know this behavior links Lord Henry to aestheticism all about beauty um, beauty is of primary importance and hedonism about experiencing pleasure regardless of whether it's moral or immoral Lord Henry at this luncheon he's using a number of aphorisms aphorisms what is an aphorism It's an expression that holds some general truth or some principle you know, like, if the shoe fits, wear it, that kind of thing. So, um, Lord Henry's using a lot of these aphorisms. A-P-H-O-R-I-S-M-S. -S. And that ends chapter 3.